In this video lecture, we're going to solve a transient conduction problem. This problem says steel balls that are 10 millimeters in diameter are annealed by heating to 1150 Kelvin and then slowly cooling to 450 Kelvin in an air environment for which T infinity equals 325. Then we're also given H as well as uh, K the thermal conductivity, rho the density, and C or CP the heat capacity. So we're asked to do the following. Plot the temperature with respect to time and then estimate the time required for the cooling process. So we are going to have a steel ball um, and it is initially very hot and we're putting it in a cooler environment so naturally it's going to gradually cool off and we want to know how long does it take to get to a particular temperature. So first of all, as this thing is cooling, um, you're going to see a high temperature in the solid, but then gradually we're going to see lower temperatures propagate into the side. So realistically there would be some uh, temperature as a function of R as well as temperature as a function of time. So we want to know how significant the temperature gradients might be or if we have to worry about both spatial and temporal changes in temperature in our steel ball as it cools. So one way of figuring out if we can do that is to first look at the BO number. So the BO number is defined as HL over K where L and L sub C is our characteristic length. So because this is a, a ball, it's a sphere, our characteristic length is going to be the volume over the surface area. So the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds times pi r cubed, and then its surface area is 4 pi r squared. So we can clearly see that uh, that cancels out, the 4s cancel out, and pi cancels out. And we end up with this characteristic length being r over 3 for a sphere. And this would apply to any sphere because we use just generic r terms. So r over 3 would be the characteristic length for the sphere. So let's calculate our BO number. So the BO number is, if you remember, it is the... Uh, conductive thermal resistance divided by the convective thermal resistance and it's a measure of how fast those things are happening relative to one another. So if convection is the slower process and by far then we'll have a small BO number which means that uh, convection will be the limiting factor and we'll have a much bigger delta T with convection and a smaller delta T with conduction. So let's evaluate this BO number based on the things that we know. So we're taking H of the air, so we have our BO number is equal to H, 25 watts per meter squared per Kelvin. Our characteristic length is R divided by 3, so our radius is 0 0.005 meters, that's divided by 3, and K is... 40 watts per meter per Kelvin. So when we compute all of those, we get a BO number, which is equal to 0 0.001. So that number, fortunately, is much, much less than 1. So this tells us that the lumped capacitance method is a good method to use for this problem because we have this BO number, which is not only less than 1, it's far less than 1. So we have a good BO number, which means we can treat this uh, sphere as being totally uniform in temperature. We don't have to worry about T as a function of both R and time. We can just say that we can just consider the temperature to be uniform and just look at temperature as a function of time. Okay, so in our last video lecture, we went through and derived this exact situation when you have a heating or cooling process in a solid that is driven only by convection. So we solved that convection-only case, and we ended up with this equation. So uh, remember, we put our temperature difference, we defined a new variable for temperature difference called theta, but you can easily just insert the definition of theta into our equation. So here we have the initial temperature, here we have the ambient temperature, 
we have all of our uh, thermal properties and some of our geometric properties of our system here. So what would we expect here? So our initial temperature is 1150 Kelvin and then our ambient temperature is 325 Kelvin. So what we would expect, and you see this exponential decay. So if we were to break this whole equation out and plot temperature as a function of time, our T sub I, our initial our initial temperature or our initial condition is going to be up here and that is at 1150 and if our ambient temperature is down here at 3 oh got dyslexic there for a minute 325 Kelvin we're going to expect this temperature of our steel ball to exponentially approach that line and eventually it'll get there. So that's what our plot will end up looking like but basically this is just we've already solved the differential equation we can just use this equation now to plug and chug because we know that because we have this small BO number that uh, convection is going to be our limiting process which means that we can assume the conduction process to be happening relatively much more quickly and because conduction is happening more quickly we'll expect smaller temperature gradients by conduction. So we're asked in the second part of this problem to figure out the time required to get to 450 Kelvin. So we want to see what time corresponds to when we get there. Okay, so because this is just a simpler plug and chug problem, I'm just going to do the honor of rearranging this equation. So our temperature is going to be equal to T infinity plus ti minus t infinity multiplied now by this exponential term so we're going to have e to the minus h a over rho v c I sometimes use cp there uh, but I'll stick with the nomenclature of this problem times time and all that's in parentheses so that's basically the equation so now all that's left is to basically take this equation and put numbers into it so I've done that already um, using just an Excel sheet. So here we have time in this column because we're asked to plot this. We're here we're looking at the solid temperature. So basically in this cell we just put in that this exact formula here and we have references to all the properties we need over here and I used absolute references for those and then just a relative reference for to get uh, the time in there. But uh, plotting this, you can see that indeed what we thought was going to happen did happen. We start out at our initial temperature, and it's really important to verify this. Uh, pretty simple check. Our initial temperature we were told was 1150. Here you can see we do indeed start out at 1150, and we do see our our temperature gradually um, ex getting exponentially close to our ambient temperature. So that's. A fairly simple problem it's just plug and chug as long as you know that your problem meets the requirements of being able to assume uniform temperature as measured by the very small BO number. Okay the other part of this question was figuring out how long it took to get to a temperature of 450. So now that we have actual numerical results here 450 is about there so somewhere around 600 seconds is when we're expecting this to happen. We can actually solve for that numerically by just uh, rearranging this equation so it can look like this. So uh, we can solve for time directly. So again, plug and chug. Here our uh, theta sub i is going to be our initial temperature difference. So this would be 1150 minus 350. And here, this is our final temperature difference. Oh, and that's not 350, my apologies, that's 325. So, and then our final temperature difference is going to be the 450 minus 325. Um, again, then we just put in all of our problem characteristics in there, and we will get something that ends up with uh, being the time, total time to go from our initial temperature down to this final temperature. So, uh, if we did all the plug and chug, we would see that, well, let's go ahead and do this just for the sake of doing it. So we get time is equal to our density, 7,800, and this is kilograms per meter cubed. And then we have our volume, which is going to be um, 
four thirds, yeah, let's see. four thirds pi times our radius, which is point zero zero five meters. That's going to be cubed, just the radius part. So rho v, and then we have our heat capacity, which is six hundred joules per kilogram per kelvin. In the denominator, we have our h. So h is 25 watts per meter squared per kelvin. And then our surface area is going to be 4 pi r squared. And our, again, our r is 0 0.005 meters squared. And then we're going to have the natural log here of 1150 kelvin minus 325. And here we have our final temperature, 450 minus our ambient temperature. So let's just do a unit check. So all the units for Kelvin just cancel out here because you have Kelvin on top and Kelvin in the denominator. Let's just do a quick unit check and make sure everything looks okay. So we get meter squared cancels out uh, with part of that. Actually, we'd have meter squared canceling out here, meters cubed canceling out here. We have our kilograms canceling out. We have our let's see, Kelvin canceling out there. So then we have joules left and watts. So if you remember, a watt is a joule per second. So joules cancels out and we are indeed left with units of seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and plug this into my calculator, which I've done offline, and we end up getting that our time is equal to 589 seconds. So does that compare with what our graphical result uh, showed? And yeah, it's actually right right there. So it takes us about 589 seconds to cool from our initial temperature down to that predetermined temperature of 450. So if you wanted to get even cooler down to 400, you can see that uh, that takes a bit longer. And the, because this profile is flattening out, because our convection driving force gets smaller and smaller as delta T gets reduced, you can see that um, there's sort of a point of diminishing returns here where it would take to truly get to 325 would take a long time.